Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a, a quote here from uh, William Booth just to start out. Can you go ahead and put that quote up from William Booth? It's a, uh, a very, very powerful quote. I'm going to just go ahead and read it to you a while. It says, the chief danger, do you guys know who William Booth is? He founded the Salvation Army. Uh, 18, like he, he was a real big deal in the 1800s. What he, this is one of his sayings. He had so many sayings. He said, go for the lost and go for the worst was one of his sayings. Go for the lost and go for the worst. And if anybody could back up the claims he had with his mouth, it was him. He, he really went after every single poor person, every, every prostitute, every, every drunkard that was on the street. I mean, he mobilized an army. That's why it's called the Salvation Army. He mobilized an army and really made a difference. Um, so this is, this is one of the last things that, that, he, that he had to say here. He says, uh, the chief danger that confronts the coming century will be religion without the Holy Ghost, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, and heaven without hell. And can you guys just take a moment and uh, just find somebody you don't know and, and just comment on this. What sticks out to you and what's true about this today? I mean, he said this before the 1900s, okay? And uh, so just find somebody you don't know, shake their hand and just, and just to mention something here that sticks out to you about something he said and give an example of it. Can you guys just do that right now? Just go ahead, find someone, shake their hand who you don't know. See if something sticks out. Don't be afraid. Don't, don't worry. You know, you know, it just, just, it's just very, very unnerving to me when I look at this quote and um, the whole thing just seems, seems very true to me. And what, what's, what's the reason why this is true is because there's a, a, we're a feeling-oriented society. Do you guys get what I mean when I say that? Is we want people to feel good and we don't want people to feel bad. You guys get what I'm saying? And so instead of preaching the gospel... Because there's certain parts of the gospel that don't feel good. Right? Am I, you guys hear what I'm saying? Um, the, the whole reason why it says uh, repentance, forgiveness without repentance, is because repentance has been removed from the gospel because who wants to repent or ever have to ask God to, to admit their shortcomings and say, I need God. Don't worry about that. Just, you, you know, you're not, you're not a sinner. You've always been a son. Just, just accept him, right? But it's, a, it's the message of reconciliation. Why would you need to be reconciled with God? Amen. You guys get what I'm saying? Why would you need to be reconciled? What's the problem? Well, before you came to him, you were. You were the problem. And, and you, you had committed heinous crimes. And you lived for yourself. You didn't live as if he was king and give him glory and thanksgiving. There was a, a stint of time there where, where, where you lived for yourself and lived from yourself. And he graciously forgives us as king. So to, to be drugged into his courts, be thrown in front of him, and, and have your crimes announced, he lifts his scepter and says, forgiven. Not only forgiven, but come join me, right? That's amazing. That's real good news. So it's not just that you were even and that you went into the positive. It's that you were way in the negative. And he forgave you of your debts, which I could celebrate that. He forgave me of my debts and he invited me into the kingdom. But see, people want to drop that other half because it doesn't make the gospel as appealing to the feelings. 
and they want people to feel good. And you could actually have someone genuinely going through repentance, genuinely sorrowful for, for, for just falling short of God's glory, and you could cut that off. Meanwhile, there was this regeneration that was taking place and say, oh, you don't, no, 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 don't, don't feel bad. Never feel bad about anything. Don't cry. Don't worry. Just, it's, it's fine. Meanwhile, God was doing a good work in them. Paul, Paul, Paul got this. He understood that he had, he had done something and he understood that he was forgiven, but he understood how much he, he had done, which is why he was so thankful for the forgiveness. You guys get that? Those who love much have been forgiven much. And so there's a place to understand how much you've been forgiven. But we don't want to do that. We just want to be forgiven little so we can love a little bit. But there's a place to understand what you've been forgiven of. And if you need a reminder of that, you can always read Romans 1, right? And it gets all into that. And, and there's a place where you're just thankful for what he's done, but there was a reason why he had to do what he had to do. You get what I'm saying? And so forgiveness without repentance is silly, and it's not even real. You guys hear me? And when, when I read this quote, heaven without hell, salvation without regeneration, forgiveness without repentance, the Holy Ghost, religion without the Holy Ghost. There's just, there's just something that was true that William Booth saw what the pastors were doing in that day and saw where things were headed, and where we are today, have you guys, I mean, if you look at just mainstream Christianity, I can promise you there is no sting or bite on it whatsoever. They would never do that. They have $30 million budgets to hit. The last thing they're going to do is lose one person over their feelings. You get what I'm saying? But so the mainstream yell is to hit the $30 million budgets that they have to hit. And it's not like they're evil people. I mean, some of, that, some of the parts of those budgets are to help the poor. You know what I mean? Because they have extravagant budgets towards missions too. So these aren't bad people. It's like they have to hit these numbers. And so the, 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 the delivery of the thing has to be so light, so gentle, that like, it lands on you like a feather. And you say, that's nice. But you've removed part of the message from the gospel. You guys get what I'm saying? And when you remove part of the message, the person can never actually be thankful because they don't know that they've been forgiven any, from anything. So let me just tell you, let me just start off just by just talking to you guys about what I believe. It's so easy as a minister to hear on behalf of your congregation. It's the easiest thing. But as a minister, I need to hear for myself. Let me, let me say that again. As a minister, it's so easy to hear God's voice on behalf of a people. Do you guys know why? Because you're precious to him. He loves you guys. He has something he wants to say. And so when I sit down, and it's, not, it's never hard. It's never, it's never difficult for, for God to come and, and, and tell me what he wants to say. But at the same time, I need to maintain a hunger for myself to hear what he's saying to me. Do you guys get that? And, and, and it's not, again, it's not hard to come into church and hear a message, but at the same time, you need to maintain a hunger for yourselves to hear what he's saying to you. You guys get that? So the first thing I would tell you is that you're very precious to God, and he's demonstrated that to a great degree. But there are a lot of people that are precious to God that are on the earth today that don't know that they are. And the reason they don't know that they are is because we haven't become about his business yet. And we're not going to become about his business till we believe what he said. And we're not going to believe what he says until, you know how the Bible says that um, the kingdom of heaven is, uh, is taken by force by violent men? Oh, I, I want to just read that quote. I, I, can, I can quote it better than that. I have it written down. Forgive me. It says, um, There we go. You guys, I have it here. It says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violent, and violent men take it by force. There's typically just some sort of form or action taken on the part of the believer towards God, and repentance has something to do with it. How many of you are, are spiritually hungry more than you've ever been right now? You guys get what I'm saying? 
And, and I believe that there's, there's some of you. I believe that some of you guys are just like, you know, I'm more spiritually hungry than I ever have been before. At the same time, it's not just words and it's not just raising your hands. Your life would demonstrate it. You get what I'm saying? There's a, 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 a hunger and thirst for righteousness, for being like God that we're supposed to hunger and thirst after that he's going to fulfill. And I, and I really believe this. And at the same time, I never sense myself falling asleep spiritually. I only ever sense myself waking up. Okay? If I could sense myself falling asleep, I wouldn't do it. The disciples, when Jesus came to them, he goes, guys, the flesh is weak, the spirit's willing, don't fall asleep. And they do it three times in a row. It's because you don't sense yourself falling asleep. But you do sense yourself waking up. Okay, and I just want to just give you an example of this. Uh, how many of you guys know who Charles Finney is? One of the greatest revivalists, the, one of the, he has been said to have been one of the greatest American revivalists of all time. He's 29 years old. He's a lawyer, right? And, and he's got it made. And, and he hears this message, and he's seen, he's seen church. He's seen religion. He's, he, he grew up in that kind of home. He's 29 years old. He's wrestling with this question, am I really saved or not? Am I really saved or not? Which is not a bad question to ask. And he goes, I am going into the woods and I'm not coming out until I'm assured that I'm saved. Now he goes into the woods. Now you gotta imagine this. The first 10 minutes, you probably felt pretty good about yourself. Because it feels like you're, you know, you've really put your foot down and I'm really standing for something here. And this feels good because I'm doing something about it and I'm in the woods and, and 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 and 60 minutes go by and the feeling fades. It doesn't feel so good to be in the woods now. It doesn't hear like you're hearing anything. It feels like you're wasting your time and Satan's chattering your ear off. Talking about what are you doing? Nothing's going to happen. This is a waste of time. You've got work to do. You've got cases that need to get done. What are you doing out here? And the second hour goes by but then the third hour comes and all you hear is crickets. And you're wondering what you're doing and why you'd ever do this to begin with. And the fourth and the fifth hour go by, and somehow he maintains a focus out there. Nothing happens. He walks back into his office. He is immediately put to the ground by God. And he says, what felt like waves of electricity rolled over my body again and again and again, and then all of a sudden, it felt like liquid love just melted all over me. Now, here's the question. Now, he started revivals. He specifically started one in Rochester, New York, that changed this nation. But it only changed because he went into the woods for a few hours. Do you guys get what I'm saying? I want to say it again. The, na the reason why this nation experienced revival is because a man chose to go into the woods for six hours. What if he wouldn't have gone into the woods? I can promise you it wouldn't have happened. And that's a promise. Because every time I look at the Bible, there's always an act of violence before God does something. Whether that's, that, that's Gideon going in and just chopping down his, his father's Asherah pole, or whether that's Moses who has to violently go before Pharaoh. Something happens, the flesh hates it, it doesn't feel good, but somebody does it anyway, and then God falls and kisses it and moves upon it. Do you guys get what I'm saying? And one of the main reasons why, one of the main reasons why we become numb to it, and I, guys, I, when I'm preaching, I'm not outside of my examples, okay, is that it's so easy to be walking this life. You're never going, no one's ever going to join you in these acts of violence. No one's ever going to join you in, in just going after the spirit and give you thumbs up and go, yeah, do it. I'm going to stay back here, but you go do it. Like, no one's doing that, okay? People will say that you're, you're being legalistic. People will say you don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to fast and pray anymore. Jesus has done it all. Don't worry about anything, right? Meanwhile, people are just, the broad gates of hell are wide open, and people of York are just marching through because nobody came to the realization of what's really going on. And the Bible actually mean what it means what it says, and God wants to use you desperately wants to use you to reach people. But he doesn't use you until you decide that you want to be used. But you're not using your mouth to say it. You have to do something in your life to say it. And it's not like people say, well, maybe if I pray enough. It's not about praying enough, but when you pray to that degree, it means that you really want it because faith without works is dead. We say it again. Faith without works is dead. It's just dead. You're just flapping your jaw. 
But when you pray, when you determine to put yourself to prayer, it's because you finally have the faith that you are or the faith is growing that it will. Did you ever hear somebody going on a long fast? It's, it's, you know, it's fine the first day. It feels righteous. You feel like you got it together. Yeah, I'm on a fast today. People are asking, you want some lunch? No, I'm on a fast. And it feels good. The next day, it doesn't feel so good. And it's at that point whether or not you decided whether or not God told you to go on one. Or you change your mind. And when somebody says, I thought you were fasting, no, no, no. No, I don't, you don't need to do that anymore. And, and we just change our mind based on our feelings. And it, man, we just really have to work through those things. You really have to stick to something and stay the course and be persistent. Through, not only are the good feelings are not going to be there, bad feelings are going to come, and you've got to stay the course and work through those things. Because to spiritually wake up, to really spiritually wake up, let, let me just tell you, when you're, when you're on, this, on this journey, it's so easy to get out in front of people on it and just go like this and just begin to just slowly turn around and look in the speck in someone's eye. And all of a sudden, instead of having your focus on Christ and, and and Paul, and Peter, and any person that can become all things in Christ, you just, just slowly just start to look back and just say, hmm, these people really need my help. Let me tell you what you're doing wrong. Yeah, you need to realize this. Yeah, if you would get this, then you... And, it, and we just slowly just seem to think that we have it together. Meanwhile, people changed the planet single-handedly. And then here's a great question, just to ask yourself. What can a single person do in Christ? Your theology on that is, will dictate your life. What can one person, just one person, do in Christ? Can one person actually become a revival? You've got to ask yourself that question. There, there's some verses in here that I read. They just still shake me. They put me to my knees. I repent before God. Listen, listen to what these verses have to say. It's in the book of John. John 15, 5. I am the vine you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. A person will bear much fruit. And if you're not in the process of bearing fruit, it's probably because you're not abiding in him. And you might say, what does that look like? You're going to have to go to him and ask. It also says this, Matthew 19, 26. And looking at them, Jesus said to them, with people this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. What do you do with a verse like that? I mean, like, what do you do? Do you just say, oh, let's go teach that to the kids and, and sing, all things are possible, na, 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 na. Meanwhile, you're, you run into these walls and you grow cold towards the impossibilities that you face and just say, well, maybe God will move someday on that stuff. When he said, man, when you're with me, you move everything. Everything will move. Every mountain will move. There's a place in Christ, listen to me, there's a place in Christ where every mountain moves. And if you don't believe that, you will sh sell yourself short and you will never be able to become what it is that Christ intended. The good works that he will prepare for you, he will have to find somebody else who actually believes they can do them. And if I'm honest, and I'm, and if I'm honest with you guys, the, the The times when I thought I was awake, I was asleep. If I'm honest. Because it's the person who, who, who believes that they're awake, views themselves that way because they're looking at the people around them. The person who's fully awake is looking towards Christ and the greatest men and women who have ever lived and said, compared to them, I'm asleep. You guys get what I'm saying? And let me just... I was talking to somebody once, and I, I, I you, you guys ever hear something um, I've said in a sermon? It's usually a one-liner. I don't explain myself. and just hit you in the gut. I apologize. But I said this. I said, the problem with us today in this church is that we're all infants in Christ, and we need to grow up. This person called me. They were insulted. They said, I am not an infant in Christ. I, he said, I'm a mature man in Christ. And I said, compared to who? Christ? Paul? And he left. But 
the, my point was, it's like, who are you looking at? Do, do you guys get what I'm saying? Who, who are you looking at? Are you looking at your neighbor who doesn't go to church? Yeah, you look wide awake. You absolutely look wide awake. And it feels better to look at them. That's the biggest problem is the whole feeling orientation. Adolf Hitler wrote this in, uh, in Mein Kampf about propaganda. Okay, this is what he wrote. He wrote that the masses are feminine in nature. If you can control their feelings, you can have them do whatever you want. And God forgive us. God forgive us of how true that is, how much our feelings dictate where we go to church, how we're going to pray, what our theology is going to be. I don't want to just feel good. I want to believe the truth. And there are these times where like, in, in my relationship with God, where he talks to me like such a big boy. You, you guys get what I'm saying? Where, he's, where he just talks to me in a certain way. And it's like, and I, I, better, I better have my big boy pants on when he's talking to me like this. Because the things that he's saying to me are true. And nobody's going to want to hear these things. But they're, they're, regardless, they're true. And I, I, I feel privileged that... that that I get to hear him like that because it does something in me. It wakes me up to what's actually possible. And it's so easy to fall asleep with what's been going on in your life and to look around at other people and decide no one's as, wa- as awake as you are. Meanwhile, you couldn't be more asleep because you still aren't bearing the fruit that you could be bearing. Do you guys understand how humility fits into this thing? You know what kind of repentance I hate? This is the kind of repentance I hate. Um, it's, it's this understanding. It's, it's someone who's committing sin who has no understanding that they don't have to. And so they keep repenting for the same sin, but their understanding keeps them in that place. They don't believe they can be like Christ, that you don't have to sin. They actually believe that they do have to sin, and they come to the altar and beg for forgiveness after every sin, but, but there's no room for growth because they can't even conceive that they could be like Christ. Do you guys get what I'm saying? I'm glad they still repent. That's, that's great. The kind of repentance that I want in my life is a godly sorrow that sees something with a single eye, that can see Christ and who he is, see myself clearly, and, that, and the Holy Spirit would lead and guide me into all truth, that I would continue to step instead of growing satisfied with what I've seen. You guys get me? What I'm least hungry is after I've seen God do something cool. And it's easy to see God do something cool in your life and to just settle up and just lay down the pillows and get the blanket and say, you know what, have someone top this, you know, and just go right to sleep. And I would ha- not have that in your life. I wouldn't have you being impressed with yourself. Feel free to be impressed with Christ. Feel free to be impressed that he died on your behalf. But do, you're not done yet. You guys get what I'm saying? You're not fully cooked yet. The Holy Spirit has more for you. And until you begin to do something violent in nature towards God and say, I'm not moving till you do something. I'm not, I'm not eating till you say something. I want you, and you can still do it, please. I don't know if you will wake up. And, and gosh, this is the greatest, one of the greatest sins in my life is, is being able to, to, to sit under the right message. Sit under the right message and have it be enough. Run with the right group of people and have it be enough instead of being the right kind of person who's living it out every day. Do you guys get what I'm saying? Because I can sit here, this could come across hard, and you can feel better that you heard it. Well, at least I got my lickings from Adam this morning. I, it feels pretty good to just have the truth told to me like that. I'm so glad that I, that I sit under a pastor who's actually, who actually tells me the truth. That feels pretty good. And just go home and just hit snooze right? And not really wake up and not actually wake up. I don't want to be fully awake in front of him having him show me fully what was available. You'll be fully awake on that day. But there's something about persistence. There's something about staying the course regardless of your feelings, regardless of your feelings, and regarding him in the midst of those bad feelings, saying, I'm staying the course to the very end. Do you guys hear what I'm saying? Psalms 36, 1 through 3, talks about falling asleep. It says, To the overseer, by a servant of Jehovah, by David, 
The transgression of the wicked is affirming within my heart. The fear of God is not before their eyes, for, he made it, for they've made it smooth to themselves in his eyes to find his iniquity to be hated. The person cannot see any longer within themselves what's still lacking. I'm not talking about beating yourself up. I'm talking about seeing Christ clearly, seeing yourself clearly, and saying, let's keep moving forward. Let's keep becoming like him. Yes, I am covered in his blood, and I am righteous, but I want that thing to manifest on the earth. You guys get what I'm saying? The only reason I can keep moving forward is because there literally is nothing in the path. There is nothing standing between me and him now. There's nothing there. He's, he's, he's ripped it all away. I can fully become like him, but I still want an eye to see what that looks like in my life because I just don't want to flab my lips about it. Is this hitting home? Do you guys get it? It's an ask kingdom. It's an ask, seek, knock kingdom. This should shudder us a little bit because it's not, don't worry, I'm just going to do it. You don't participate kingdom. You guys get it? You're always, as Brian, uh, Brian if I'm quoting you, I apologize uh, without giving him credit. I believe Brian said this one time, you're always going to find what you're looking for. You're always going to get what you're asking for. In this kingdom, the question is, what are you really asking for and what are you really seeking? Not what you understand that you think you're seeking for, but what is your life saying that you're seeking? Throwing up a five-minute prayer to God every other week, I just don't know if that's asking and seeking and knocking. I don't know. Some of you guys who have loved ones who are saved, what does that actually look like to ask, seek, and knock on their behalf? What does that really look like? You know what feels better? To become numb to it. To become numb, react, numb to the realities of the gospel that don't feel good, pretend like they don't exist. Let me ask you a question. If God sovereignly came down here, touched your eyes, and showed you who was going to heaven and who was going to hell, and they wore it on their chest, your life would be radically different. You'd be on your knees on the street pleading with people to come to Jesus Christ. Would you not? If you knew... Is there a place in Christ where he can tell you? But it's easier to walk around numb to these realities because we don't want to feel them because we want to feel good. And trust me, there's times in Christ where I feel great because of what he's done on my behalf. But then there's just a time where I just get about his business and the reality that stands in front of me is this world isn't heaven yet. And I'm not saying this to you as if I have this all mapped out and I'm, and I'm the pastor and I'm getting this done. This is, this is aching within me because I just need God and his realities in heaven to become a greater reality in my life to where I'm stirred to action. To where I, it's not no more status quo. It's no more, you know, this is just how I do life. This is how long I pray. This is, this is what I'm willing to do. And we draw our own lines and say this no further. Then we get the pillows and the blankets. You guys get me? If you're sitting there right now, and this is actually hitting you, congratulations, like you might be waking up a little bit. That's great news. It's great news. But when we draw on the lines, when we just start to see our own lives, and we just start to see our own problems, and, and man, I just, I just wish it was like this. I just wish that I believe this gospel more. I, I just, because I'm not, I like, and I, I there, there's just some, there's some things that I believe. I'm not about, like, you know, like, go, go beat yourself up. There's a place to celebrate where you've come from. And there, I, you know what I believe? I, like, when I talk about being a steward of all things, like, I, I'm not promised my wife, I'm not promised my kids, every day with them is a gift. You guys get that? Every day is a gift. I don't have issue with them. It's a gift to be with them. I'm not promised this job. It's a gift that I get to steward for a time. I'm not promised my relationship with Brian. It's a gift that I get to steward. And there's, it's, I, I, I don't have issues with those things because I'd be having issues with something that I was supposed to steward. You guys get what I'm saying? But this, this thing called the gospel and the reality of it, 
needs to get bigger. And I know like you, you were trained to tell people that you believe the gospel. You're just like me. When you were young, someone sat you down probably and said, now when someone asks you these things, you say yes because you believe them. Meanwhile, the evidence couldn't be farther away from you. I get that. I grew up in the same situation where you're told what you believe instead of having an expectation, a healthy expectation to, to live what you believe. And we've never lived in a world where people are so isolated, where you can just sit with technology and never have to have anyone know anything about you, and you can present yourself with pictures of the sun setting and quote Jesus. Meanwhile, you live like you're in hell, your life's falling apart, but you can present yourself any way you want. And nobody knows who you are, and you will not be known because you don't want to be known. Meanwhile, he said, come and step into the light so that your deeds may be exposed. Good or bad, who cares? Just step into the light. You want to know what Max Myers was saying? You know what he said the evidence of revival was before it actually came? People stood up and interrupted his sermon and confessed sin openly. That's an act of violence that no one's used to. But where the, the, the presence of God, you feel it so strongly, and you know what you've been doing is so wrong, you just stand up and say, I got to say that. I got to get this off my chest. I can't any, no longer live like this. That's an act of violence. What do you think God does to a person like that? Who doesn't care what everybody in the room thinks, but only cares in that moment what God thinks? And he can no longer move forward? What do you think God does? He says, that's my boy, and he just comes, and he just takes that person and does something in them that he wasn't able to do before because they didn't want it before. They didn't want it bad enough. You might say, why hasn't God done this? It's because simply because you don't want it bad enough. But you are getting the stuff that you want bad enough. You want entertainment. You want to feel good. You're getting it. You're getting all of it. Everything that you want, you're getting all the time, and you're giving yourself to it, right? But when you want him bad enough, I can promise you, I can promise you that he gives himself to those who want him bad enough. And the only reason why you don't have more God experiences is because there's a hunger that needs to get stirred up even, in, even more so in your life. You guys hear what I'm saying? And so you don't fall asleep. You don't, you don't sit there impressed with yourself. You have my full permission to be impressed with Christ because he died on your behalf. Go for it. That's awesome. But to sit there, please, don't take your eyes off Jesus. Don't take your eyes off Paul. Don't take your eyes off Peter and understand that it's possible for one person to change the world. It's possible for someone to crush impossibilities and move every mountain in front of them to that person who wants to be about their father's business. It's not about being a minister. It's not about having a pulpit. It's not about having a ministry. It's about you and what's in front of you and what you could possibly do because of your hunger for him and what he's done. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not like, I was, uh, I was listening, I was listening to, to, to Leonard Ravenhill because he always just, there's, no, there's not a spoonful of sugar to help the medicine go down when he's preaching. It's just straight medicine. And, you know, he was talking about prayer and how, how I mean, this is the, you know, 70s and 80s he's talking at this point. He's talking about how people aren't hungry enough to give themselves to prayer. And he says, there was a Baptist preacher that came to one of my meetings. He came into my meeting, and he had a congregation of 60 people that would come out to the Wednesday night meetings. And he says, and I turned the Wednesday night meetings into prayer, and it turned into six people. Why? Because people don't want to pray. They want to hear messages, so they don't have to go and hear for themselves. And I've done that. I've said this to myself. When I knew I was supposed to go and sit at his feet, I've turned on YouTube. You know, because I just, it, my flesh wanted to sit and watch, not wait and carry burden. You guys get what I'm saying? I asked my wife, I said, listen, I said, I got, he said this, he goes, you, you want to know why? There, 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 were, there are times when people have said this, I can feel the tangible presence at praise. I remember when we did that homeless dinner, that person said, as soon as I got off the bus and my foot touched the concrete, I felt the tangible presence of God. Did you know that's actually possible? The reason why we're a house of restoration is because I'm actually talking about you. You're a house of restoration that is, um, that is presence-driven and identity-focused. I'm not talking about the church. I'm talking about you. 
and that when you walk, it is actually possible for people to feel the presence of God licking off you when you walk down the street. And people become aware of their shortcomings, not because you're judging them, but because God's been poured out upon you. That's possible. It's possible for every single thing in the Bible to take place today. It's actually possible. It's actually possible for you to get hungry enough and say, God, I'm a coward. I, I, I don't do the things that, that make sense biblically. If I believed your word, I'd probably be doing this. I'm currently not. Please come and help. What do you think he's going to do? Ignore that kind of integrity and honesty? No. He's coming. Saying, that's my boy. That's my girl. And he's coming. Because he gives grace to the humble. That power to transform your life. His loving kindness, that power that comes and just says, here you go. Okay. Let's go ahead and start the sermon. Turn to Luke 18. Let me just read you the rest of these verses. This, this humbles me. John 14, 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. And you can sit there and use that in your back pocket as an argument towards somebody who doesn't believe the same thing you believe, and pull that verse out when it's convenient to prove your point. Meanwhile, your life is just covered in impossibilities. Heaven forbid, Right? Let me read you another verse. If I, could, if I could just be real, if I could just be real, every time I lay hands on somebody to, 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 to ask God and, and to command sickness to go, this verse is in the back of my mind, and I never go anywhere else but that verse in John that says that to those who believe, they will do greater things. Christ never had a problem, and I've laid my hands on so many people. I've seen them get healed, and I've seen them die or not get healed. And that verse just echoes, and I will never let go of that verse. I will never succumb to my experience and say, well, you know, maybe God's not doing that anymore. Maybe God's just busy. Maybe something else is going on. Then you've got to do something with the whole book of John. Then you better cut it out of your Bible. Listen to this verse. He who has my commandments and keep them is the one who loves me. Those who are in my family are those who do the will of the Father. Please, please don't cons- like just succumb to this, this modern day preaching that requires nothing of you. It, it costs you nothing to be saved except to believe and confess. And that is true. And now that you're in his house, now that you're his son or daughter, now that you're like him, there's work to be done and he has full expectation that you're his man or woman. Now that you've been regenerated, now that you've been sanctified, now that you've been justified, what do you think your life's going to look like on this earth? The same as if you weren't? Thank God he has healthy expectations for us. You want people who have healthy expectations. You know what I like about my Kyo group? There's an expectation that's present that you're doing something on behalf of God because you're doing his will because you love him. It doesn't say those, those who confess him as Lord are those who love him. It says those who keep his commandments, those who do the will of the Father. The question isn't, does God love you? Has he not proven that? The question is, do you love him? Period. You have the rest of your life to declare that with your life. Not with your lips, with your life. John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. You know what, can I just be honest? So many people just take this verse, they chop it up, and it says ask whatever you wish. Do you know there's still things that I wish and that I ask for that I don't receive, which means there's more of an abiding to do in him. There's some place where I'm not abiding, that I, I, in relationship with the Holy Spirit, not a pastor, not YouTube, not, not, not history, but with the Holy Spirit, there's a place where there's more of me that abides in him than I currently have. This verse challenges me. I don't know what you guys do with this verse. I don't know if you guys like a theology where you play small because it feels better to play small because you don't have to carry any weight of the gospel or any weight of the responsibility and, and, or any of that. I don't know if that's what you guys do. But when I read these verses, they just prick me like a sword in my heart and just say, come get some. Come find me. Get hungry. And it's like, 
You know what's easier, though, and feels better? Well, this is only inside of his will. It's only inside of his will. Can you ask these things? And if you're asking things inside of his will, then I'll do them. Meanwhile, children are dying. That's the will of the devil. And nobody wants to be crushed by the weight of the responsibility, so we tend to just shrug it off. We shrug off the impossible and say, maybe, maybe he'll do that someday. Maybe that's for that person or that. Not to mention stage Christianity where we've trained people to believe that the person on stage is the one who's supposed to be doing the will. We're just supposed to be attending what they're saying. Oh, God, help us. You, you know what I'm saying? We've never, we've never needed people to be so hungry for God. As a congregation, as an individual, you have a choice. It says you need to decide and, and what it means and what it looks like to, to hunger and thirst for righteousness, what it actually looks like. And everybody in this place, I, I, I don't know... Um, In Luke 18, it just, it's beautiful, and we won't even get to it, but there's a, there's a, there's a chance here. And I know when, when Brian was prophesying over an open door, and, and I, you know, it mentions that in Scripture. And you know what I feel like the open door is? The open door is, is a place to be radical for him because you hunger actually for him. And, that, and stepping through that door sometimes is an act of violence on your behalf. Aggressiveness towards God in a, in, a, in a hardcore pursuit of what is next in your life. You guys hear me? And I think sometimes we grow so satisfied. Like, I remember I used to just, just bang the symbol over and over again. Don't be satisfied with the testimony from five years ago. Have one this week. Right? But you can grow satisfied with the fact that you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. That God's touched you. But in the book of Acts, they were continually touched because of their continual hunger for him. So will you guys just stand with me? Do you guys just mind if I pray? I know, I know for me, I don't have all the details, so I, I don't have any details for you. But I know, like, I really felt like... Um, when I heard Ravenhill talking, he was talking about having a, a prayer meeting in a, in, in a church every, every night for an extended period of time. And um, I know that when he said that, I just started crying. I said, God, you know, if there's, if, there's a, if there's a place in sacrifice in my life, which means that somebody in this congregation would be touched enough that they would go and literally save a loved one from hell. Like, please, I need to do whatever I possibly can in you to, to have that happen. If, 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 if having the faith to pray for an extended period of time and have prayer meetings um, every night if I need to, 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 to have your, your presence upon me or on me in this place that someone would be touched by you and, and, and save somebody. Lord, it's so worth it. Help me to believe it. And I heard Ravenhill talking. When he said, when he said talked about extended prayer meetings, I started to cry. And for, for me, I know, I, 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 had to, I went and talked to my wife. I said, you know, I want to have, I, I have prayer at, at the church for, for 21 days where I'd be gone for an hour a night just in the church praying. And she said, That's, that seems like the Lord. And that's impre- that must be the Lord. Your spouse says you're going to go somewhere for 21 nights. You, that better be God. And, and I'll have more details for you guys. But I know that's what God's calling me to do. It's just to give up 21 nights in a row and just be in a place and just pray what it is that he's saying. And I know that there's some of you guys here that would join me. I know that there's some of you guys here that, that can't join me. It doesn't matter. I don't care if it's just me. It's just that I, I know what's possible when I look around I don't see it happening. And I can't, there's nobody, I can, there's nobody else's shoulders I can put that on. Neither can you. You guys get what I'm saying? There's nobody else's shoulders you can say, well, here, you, you carry this cross for me because I don't feel like bearing it. It's, it's, it's your cross. Pick up your cross and follow me. And say, don't worry, I'm carrying the cross for you. There's something that you were intended to carry and it's supposed to be a light load and when it's Christ, it is. When your hunger gets satisfied, when Charles, Charles Finney wasn't lying on the ground having the Holy Spirit wave after wave hitting him with electricity saying, why did I spend those five hours in the woods? He wasn't. 
He was satisfied because God came because of his hunger. And if you're hungry, you got to go talk. You just can't walk out of here and go eat lunch and, and, and just say, you know, that was a good sermon today. I liked his outfit. I didn't. Forget all that stuff. Just forget it. Go get along with God and ask, God, what does it look like to hunger and thirst after you? What is, what is it supposed to look like right now? Because the clothes that fit you last year do not fit you this year. But if, you, if you're a small child and you're growing and you don't change the size of your foot, your foot will be deformed. And you, and you got to figure out what this, what this next thing looks like in your life and what kind of act of violence it looks like in the kingdom to grab hold of it so that you might have it. So Father, I just ask in Jesus' name that you would just come into this place, that you would come down on people tonight while they're, 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 they're doing the same thing, God. The same thing, whether it's, it's, it's just pointless stuff that doesn't, that's not going to be eternal, that you would come down and say, hey, come, come get alone with me. Come, I have something to tell you. I have something that I want you to do. If you really hunger and thirst for me, this is what I'm asking you to do. And for you to do it, it requires faith. It's, it's going to feel good at first, but I can promise you it won't in a, in a little while. And you have that persistence and that consistency to, to walk through it anyway to the very end. I got to tell you guys that 21 nights of prayer, it's going to be hopping the first night, hopping maybe a little bit the second night, the third and fourth and fifth night. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know how many people are going to attend after the first two times. But I do know that something's going to be at the end for me. And I look forward to it. So, Father, I just I thank you that it's an ask, seek, knock kingdom. And there's nothing casual about the asking, seeking, and knocking. It's actually very violent. And, God, and I just hope that this, this sermon has stirred people to action. I hope this sermon has taken people out of a place of just sleepiness and has woken them up a bit, God. Don't let us hit the snooze button while we're here. Just wake us up, God, to this reality. Let there be a personal hunger that burns in this place. Lord, I personally apologize for any sleepiness that, that has been in my life to any lack of spiritual awareness in my life. I am so dissatisfied with sermons and ministry. God, if you're not with me upon this thing, I don't want it. It's going to burn up anyway and not amount to anything. So, Father, I just ask that you would just burn in the hearts of the people here and that there would be a genuine asking, seeking, and knocking that would take place so that your will could be done in your county. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. You guys have a great Sunday. Yeah. Um, I, I have to work out the details of my life.